So I am going to be uh, doing a tutorial on how to check the assumptions required for item response theory or IRT models with polytomous items in R. Polytomous items are just items with more than two response options. We'll load the, some packages that we'll need first. Um, I have script here to install these if you don't have them installed. The syntax used here in this video is going to be available via a link in the description. And um, I'm going to import my data frame next. Um, note that I'm, I'm using an R project, so I don't have to specify the full path of where my data are, because R knows it's in this specific folder where the project is. And then because I've got several variables um, other than the items of the measure I'm going to be examining in the data set, I'm going to just subset a new data frame with only the items. The measure that I'm using is the uh, depression self-rating scale for children, which is a 24 item questionnaire assessing depressive symptoms in youth. And the items are scored zero to two. Some of them are reverse scored. And so the first assumption, uh, first assumption I'm going to be looking at is monotonicity. Monotonicity is um, for polytomous items. That means that the probability for endorsing a higher response or a response reflecting more of the construct should increase as the latent um, construct increases. So in this case, kids with more depressive symptoms should be more likely to choose response options that reflect more depressive symptoms. It's important to note that any items that are reverse scored in your data set should be reverse coded so that more um, a higher endorsing a higher value reflects more of the construct. And that's already been done here. I'm going to be using the Mokin package. Um, and this package has, um, there's some issues here with masking, which is, um, th this function has some functions with a similar, or similar names to um, other packages that I'm using here, like dplyr. There's another function called select that's in Mokin. So if I want to use select from dplyr, you have to put the package name and then these two colons before the function name. And then it, or we'll know which one you're talking about. Um, and then I'm going to omit missing data so that, um, but just because these uh, analyses don't allow for missing data, unfortunately. Um, and then to check monotonicity, I'll just run this quick function. And first, I'm actually going to look at the plots. So um, these plots, um, how, how monotonicity is, is calculated in, in this function is by rest is is with rest scores which are rest rest scores are a participant's total sum score for the whole scale minus their score on a particular item so item one in this case for each item participants are divided into groups based on ranges of their rest scores mm -hmm. or rest score groups and those are plotted on the x-axis here with a uh, probability of endorsing the item plotted on the y-axis plot on the right visualizes the overall monotonicity of the item by visualizing average responses across rest score groups and the probability of endorsement is increasing up until this third rest score group and then it decreases slightly this slight decrease would be a slight violation of monotonicity and this plot um, plots the likelihood of endorsing each uh, response category over over rest score groups and you're always going to have one less lines than you do response options. So I've got three response options. I've got two lines here. One of them represents the probability of endorsing at least um, at least one, at least a score of one. And the other line represents um, the probability of endorsing at least a score of two. And you can look at all these plots uh, for all the items and just informally inspect monotonicity. And there's also a statistical tests to look at this. So if you examine um, just this results object, you get pretty detailed inspection of monotonicity violations for each item. I'm just scrolling to item one here. And um, let's see. So this is a summary of violations and monotonicity for item one. We have a list here of each rest score group. We've got four in total, the lowest score and the highest score in each rest score group, number of people in each rest score group, and um, the frequency of um, the frequency of the item scores, the mean item score for the rest group, and then uh, the probability of endorsing a score of at least one probability for probability of endorsing a score of at least one for each rest score group, probability of endorsing a score of at least two for each rest score group, 
the highest score on this measure is a two so this is really just the probability of endorsing two a score of two and then down here for each um, for each response category we have a number of violations the maximum value of, of the violations and um, the the rest score groups involved in the violations and whether the violations were significant AC is number of active pairs of rest score groups, which represents the maximum possible amount of monotonicity tests for each item. And then this is a uh, number of violations per active pair, sum of violations of monotonicity, and um, sum per active pairs. And you can see here there's two violations for scores of uh, one or more, but those are not statistically significant. And if you want to just see um, like a, a quick summary of if you have significant violations you can run summary and we can see here there's only one significant violation of monotonicity which is for item six and we can look at that more closely so here um, there's one violation for scores of one or greater and groups three and four are, are the ones involved and uh, that is statistically significant so um, Typically, I think this would mean you would take this item out of the questionnaire since it's not consistent with the assumption of monotonicity, the assumptions of IRT, but for kind of teaching purposes, so to, to, to illustrate how these um, assumptions are related to each other, I'm going to leave the item in the measure for now. Next, we're going to look at unidimensionality. Um, unidimensionality is just the idea that a scale measures a single latent construct and nothing else. So this measure should measure depressive symptoms and nothing else. And one way to look at that in Moken scale analysis, which is um, a, an IRT, a common IRT framework that's used to assess assumptions that I'm using here, there's an assumption that items can be used to order people according to how much of a construct they have, like degree of depressive symptoms, for example. So a person who gives a high response or a response reflecting a lot of the construct to a question and assessing severe depressive symptoms, that person should also be more likely to give a, a high response or a response that reflects a lot of depression or a high level of depression to a question that assesses less severe symptoms or has a lower threshold. A violation of this assumption is called a Gutman error and scalability coefficients can be computed to summarize the impact of Gutman errors on the quality of your items. And so the function you use to do this is called COFH. Um, and the output you get is scalability coefficients for each item and then for the scale overall. And you can put these, um, you can make objects that separate between like the scale and just the item coefficients if you want to. So inspecting these, um, typically you want these to be at least 0.3 and you want them to be uh, positive. Values closer to one reflect less Gutman errors. Values farther from one reflect more Gutman errors. And uh, notably, we've got a negative one here, so that's um, not consistent with the assumption of unidimensionality or, or um, you know, the idea of, of minimizing Gutman errors, so you would want to exclude that item. And now that we, so now that we know some of our items have scalability coefficients below the typical cutoff and one item has negative scalability, one thing we can do about that is run an automated item selection procedure where, um, this is also through Moken scale analysis, um, this function uses a clustering procedure to create new scales where the starting set is a pair of items with the highest covariance. Then additional items are added to the scale to maximize the overall scalability. And this process is repeated until almost all the items are added to new scales. And sometimes there's items left over that don't fit in. And you specify minimum scalability and an alpha level. So I'll do that here. And Interestingly, these items get separated into two scales, even though this is supposed to be a unidimensional scale. Um, and these, um, this, this first scale includes items that are sort of dysphoric or assessing depressed mood, depressed cognitions, like um, I'm not going to get the things that I want or I feel really sad. And uh, this scale is more items that are kind of positively worded or reflect like pleasure or enjoyment, like um, I enjoy things as much as I used to, for example. So that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. So um, now we will go to single factor CFA. 
um, to, to look at local independence. So the last major assumption of IRT is local independence or the idea that you, once you account for the latent construct that a scale is measuring, the items shouldn't co-vary with one another because all the relations among the items should be accounted for by the latent construct and nothing else. And the easiest way I've seen to do this is to look at um, residual correlations uh, uh, among items after doing uh, a CFA to, to account for the common factor. So I'll run a CFA here with the Levon package. And this is another good way to look at unidimensionality. It's, it's pretty common. So um, we could, we, if this you know, is a uni unidimensional measure, we would expect these to be relatively high factor loadings, again, around like 0.3 or more. And some of them are, some of them are, are, are a bit lower than that. Um, so we've run that. And we can also um, kind of use CFA to test the validity of, um, you know, the, the two scales proposed by the automated item selection procedure. So we can run a CFA with two factors that are, um, that, that correspond to the scales identified in the automated item selection procedure and compare the fit of these two and see which one fits better, the, the two factor or the single factor. So I'll run this and we can compare the fit. Um, and you can see that the fit for, um, for the uh, two factor model is, is significantly better, a smaller chi-square. So um, if we were going to proceed with more IRT analyses, we might wanna consider a multi-dimensional approach that has, incorporates the, the two factors or the two scales based on that. But for now, um, I'm just going to keep examining the um, unidimensional one for just for simplicity of, of teaching about how to, how to check these assumptions. So um, to check local independence, like I said, you wanna look at residual correlations and we can pull those out using, using this code. And I am going to look at it at a data frame with um, the variable uh, labels or the item labels, the item content added just for, for ease of my own kind of interpretation. And you can look at this in, in R, but it's um, a little bit kind of ungainly to scroll through, I think. So um, kind of a, a nice way, I think, to look at this is to actually export to Excel. Um, and this just goes to, to my directory here. And um, you can, yeah, you can look at it in Excel, and then you can actually do some conditional formatting to highlight everything um, that would reflect local independence. And I, I, I should have said this before, but um, items that are considered to be locally dependent have correlations greater than the absolute value of 0.1. So more than 0.1 or less than negative 0.1. Um, the idea being that if the correlation is more than the absolute value of 0.1, that's a relationship that is, that is not nothing that is not being accounted for by the latent variables. So um, I'll, do, I'll do greater than or equal to. And I'll do point one here, uh, just light red fill. So it's highlighted everything greater than point one, and now I'll highlight everything less than negative one, less than or equal to rather. Um, and I'll just do it in a different color. Yeah. So we can see here there's there's quite a few violations of of local independence. So that's kind of um, something to keep in mind as, you know, a potential limitation that um, there's associations among these items that are not accounted for by, by the latent factors that, um, that this, this whole scale is supposed to be measuring. So, um, yeah, um, what all these analyses have showed us is that our items are mostly monotonic, although item six had a significant violation. Um, and it be, would be best to exclude that item. And then regarding unidimensionality, we also saw the scalability of these items is best when they're divided into two different scales. And that was also supported by a, a two-factor CFA, which, which had superior fit to a one-factor CFA. Um, and there's still, um, there's significant local dependence among, um, among the items. And if, if we look at, if we go back um, and look at this, these are actually this local um, dependence, these red values in particular, th these are mostly among um, many of the variables that loaded onto that second scale. So I would expect if you looked at these residual correlations from the two-factor CFA, you would see um, a bit less. 
Um, so keeping these results in mind for IRT analyses that you know I might do in the future, it'd be best to use either multi-dimensional IRT or maybe to look at the two scales defined here separately. So um, I hope this has been a helpful overview of how to check key IRT assumptions in R. Um, there's again a link to this syntax in the description and if you have any questions my email is also in the description as well. Thanks.